Welcome back. We're talking Abye today on Inside Story, a disputed region in Sudan which is now trying to get its future sorted uh, in an international court. Now, the region Abye and its status has become such a divisive issue between uh, the government and the rebels in the south is because, and we see this the world over, don't we, there is oil in the region. It was discovered back in 1979. And even the special protocol actually devised to resolve the Abye issue hasn't had much success. Before we continue our discussion, have a quick look at this report from Al Jazeera correspondent Mohamed Val, who's been to the region and has seen what oil has really done to Abye and its people. Lush pastures and generous streams where cows can frolic in cool water and feast all day. This is the good life for the African and Arab elders of Abye. They shared it for centuries and often fought over it but never imagined anything of value under the soil. The discovery of billions of dollars of oil was no friend to this pastoral world. Their land was invaded by heavy industry and turned into a stage for multiple powers battling for the riches of the land. Oil has transformed a simple tribal feud between Dinka and Misiria over water and pasture into a proxy war between northern and southern Sudan, a war not without its foreign dimension. The United States, which is locked out of Sudan's oil, is seen as siding with Juba, while China, which is extracting Abyei's oil, is seen as supporting Khartoum. A committee of foreign experts led by the US and stipulated in the peace agreement drew a controversial line in the sand between Arab and Dinka ancestral areas. They gave the bulk of northern Sudan's proven oil fields to the Dinka. Khartoum was outraged. <laughs> It's a map drawn by those experts with no relation to any Sudanese map in history. And they annexed oil fields to Abyei in order to turn it into a conflict area and deepen the crisis. The southerners who welcomed the committee's ruling are just as furious that the north has rejected it. What Ms. Hiri has been saying now is nonsense. It's not true. They are one to take our area. The government is pushing Ms. Hiri and the government is behind the Syria. Because they found oil in the Ngok Dinka area, they want to loot the oil and go away with it without sharing it. That is why they are refusing the border. It's obvious. Neither side is ready to give up one inch of this oil-rich land. Even if heaven falls on the earth, no compromise on the border. Time for compromises are gone. If this is denied to Abyei, then there is no reason for Sudan to be a country. Local people say if the conflict is left to them, they can solve it overnight. But that's unlikely due to the high stakes involved. My God, we have no say in this. Isn't the government stronger than us? We're just poor people. All we want is development. Impoverished, Abyei's tribes have benefited least from its oil. And if the crisis goes unresolved, they will reap misery on a greater scale. A country known as Sudan will disintegrate or enter another era of war. Mohamed Val, Al Jazeera, from Haglik Oil Field, Central Sudan. Remind you of our guests today for this discussion in The Hague is Dr. Luca Biongdeng from the SPLM, and uh, in London is Sara Pantoliano uh, from the Overseas Development Institute. Just like to mention at the stage, we were hoping. Uh, for a guest from the National Congress Party in Khartoum, the ruling party of Sudan. Unfortunately, they've not been able to make it uh, to our studios in Khartoum. Obviously, we'd like to hear their side of the story as well, as this is all about a partition, potential partition between the ruling party in the north uh, and groups in the south. However, we will press on with our two guests, and I'd like to go back to Sara Pantoliano in London. You heard Mohamed Val's report there, I hope, obviously looking at the effects of oil in the Abye region. And in Mohammed's words, he said, Abye's impoverished tribes have benefited least from the oil. If Abye was to break away and join the South, do you think that would change? Do you think the people would start to benefit? Um, it's difficult to say. I mean, in any case, the oilers 
pr you know, cause some fundamental change to the ecosystem that will not be reversed. And these have impacted, you know, the Misteria community probably more than the Dinka community so far. You know, when I was traveling in Dar Misteria in uh, in October, I could see, you know, the the, the impact that uh, the oil in, in installations have had on the communities and have had incessantly from Misteria groups about, you know, the impact this has had um, on the access to grazing as well as uh, um, the, in the degradation of the environment, the pollution of water resources for their livestock and so forth. Um, this has been a fundamental element of change in their livelihood system um, and has obviously contributed to you know, further exacerbate the tensions with the Dinka as because the restrictions on the grazing um, in the northern part of Abie has uh, determined an even greater need to go south into Dinka not land to be able to access grazing for their livestock. Um, whether ABA goes under the control of the South, I mean, the, the, the fundamental problem is to find a solution that accommodates the interest of both. Um, we cannot envisage a solution that goes, you know, entirely one way or the other, because as I was saying earlier, peace will not um, return to, to the region unless uh, an accommodation is found um, that guarantees th the basic interest of the two groups. Luca Byung-Zeng in The Hague, do you see oil as a difficult sticking point in any division? I know we're talking about a political division, but when it comes to something like oil, it, it, it's, 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 it's an important thing. It, it's, it's money in the end, it, potential money for whoever gets control over it. Do you see it playing a big part in the future of Abye? Yeah, I, I think there's no doubt. I think uh, the people of Abye, they wish if the oil were not to be discovered in that area. And I think the argument of curse is, is, is quite pertinent and very clear in the BI area. But I think there's an issue that we would like, who is really interested in the, in, in the oil? And who is getting the oil? Because I think the, uh, the, the assumption that the problem in the BI area is between Dinka and Misiria, I think it is, it is baseless. Because if you go to the, to the oil, who is really interested in the oil? It is the government, not the Misiria. Even the SPLM argued and actually negotiated on behalf of the Missyria to give them 2% of the oil produced in the BI area for their development. The Missyria people, they have very fundamental basic issues. Issue of access to grazing and water, as Sarah mentioned, but issues of development. And that's why the SPLM is even very keen, because the people of Missyria, like the people of the BIA, have been marginalized for long. And they have been used by the government in order to push this agenda of conflict and tension in the area. So it's not an issue between Missyria and, and Dinka. It is an issue of the establishment of the government of Sudan that is so interested in the issue of oil. We coming to the, to the Hague here, I think I, I would like to make some few points. And I think what, what Sarah said, whether the agreement has provided for each of these two communities. The agreement is very clear. The ABI protocol has given the right for the Missyria people to move seasonally to a BA area for grazing and water. This is a fundamental issue for the survival of the Missyria and has been provided for in the, in the protocol. Secondly, the 2% was meant for the development of Missyria area because these are the people marginalized, affected as well by the, by the successive regime policies that actually target the rural Sudan. And that's why I don't see if Missyria, their interests are captured in the ABA protocol. I don't see they could be pushing now for the issue of ABI Boundaries Commission uh, report. Thirdly, I think the issue of the ABI people, the people of Ngoak Dinka, clearly they have political interests. And their political interests, they want to be part of the larger community of Southern Sudan. And that's why the agreement managed to provide a referendum for people of ABI to be exercised simultaneously with the people of Southern Sudan to decide whether they would like to be in Northern Sudan or to be in Southern Sudan. So it's an agreement that is encompassing the interests of all the communities. The problem, and that's very important, why the government is deciding not to respect this agreement and the ABI Boundaries Commission report. I think your, your, your reporter put something very not basis on, on, on the right, that the, the, export, uh, the experts have taken a large part of Northern Sudan to the Dinka, just for common sense. Imagine the indigenous people of Sudan are Dinka, the Nilotic, and we know that one. What about the Arab, Arabs when they started coming to the area? Hmm. They, they start coming in the 14th century. I mean, there's no way you can talk about the indigenous people and the migrants. 
And I think that's why we are, I'm not want, I don't want to go to this issue of who is, who's, whose land is. And that's okay, why well, let, let me just go to the issue then. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you because we are starting to run short on time. I want to go to the issue which you have raised yourself, this idea of a larger community of southern Sudan, northern Sudan. It's the heart of the issue in the end because in 2011 there will be a referendum on this issue. Let me just go back to uh, Asada in London again because you've been on the ground there. I wonder, just to give our viewers an idea of what the people there want, when it comes down to this idea of partition, two separate states, two separate countries in effect, what do they want? It depends which people you're talking about. I mean, clearly, the southerners, you know, the Dinkanok, see a future um, with the rest of southern Sudan, you know, possibly in a, um, in a separate southern Sudan. That seems to be the, the, you know, the prevailing sentiment in southern Sudan. Amongst um, the Missouri community, feelings are mixed. Um, you know, th there's been a reconciliation conference between the Missouri, you know, the different Missouri groups in, uh, um, in October, where some Missouri youth have expressed the desire of maintaining a joint region with the Dinkanok. Um, th as I was saying before, there is a strong sense of, uh, you know, being at a loss, not really knowing, you know, what they want. They they feel abandoned in, in every sense, you know, but by the government with which they've been allied un uh, until recently. Uh, obviously, they don't enjoy relations which are, you know, particularly harmonious with the Dinka, to use a euphemism. Um, and they have difficult relations with the neighbors, you know, with the Rizegat as well. Um, so, you know, some of them have been describing a, a feeling of almost being surrounded by uncertainty and not really know, you know, what uh, um, the future will hold for them. And I think, you know, this is uh, uh, the, the biggest uh, concern is obviously what would happen if uh, um, the South does, in, you know, exercise the right um, to secession and ABA chooses to go with the South, the Dinkanok cho choose to go with the South. They see that as the end of their um, social social, economic, you know, um, mm. sort of community life. Um, and and there at so far, as Luca was mentioning, there has been very little in terms of investment, you know, in terms of development in these communities. They haven't really seen the benefits of this oil wealth um, that, you know, is uh, um, in their region. Um, and therefore, it is very um, uh, difficult for them to think of alternative livelihoods to right. livestock keeping, to pastoralists. Interesting issue. Three months' time, we reckon we might get something out of The Hague, and then, of course, that referendum in 2011. We'll keep an eye on it. Thanks to our guests, Luca Biongdeng in The Hague and Sara Pantoliano in London. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our viewers for joining us for this edition of Inside Story. You can send us comments and suggestions, if you like, to uh, that email address there. It's inside story at aljazeera.net. From the whole team, goodbye for now. <laughs>